Hello and welcome to Big Ideas for Small Spaces. This series of webinars is brought to you by Gardening the Hudson Valley and I'm your host Marie Iannotti. I hope you've been enjoying the series so far. If you've missed any episodes, you can access them on the website at www.gardeningthehudsonvalley.com. And today we are visiting Locust Grove in Poughkeepsie, New York. Locust Grove is best known as the former home of Samuel F. B. Morse of Telegraph and Morse Code fame. But as we'll learn today, the gardens and landscape also owe a great debt to another family who called Locust Grove home. With me today are Tim Steinhoff, the director of the horticulture department, and horticulturist Susan McGavery. Welcome to you both. I thank you so much for being here as a former volunteer. I can tell you that um, I'm really excited to have a chance to talk with you today about how you keep the garden so vibrant and uh, what we can learn uh, from the lessons that you've culled from working here. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, can you give us a little overview of the Locust Grove? Locust Grove, the, the genesis of the landscape that we see today is the mid-19th century when Samuel Morse came to the estate uh, and his contribution, the part of it that we can still see today, is the landscape park uh, that goes from the house that's on the bluff that faces the river and, and goes all the way out to Route 9. Uh, like many other people in the Hudson Valley at that time, landowners, uh, he designed the landscape himself in the romantic style, uh, planting trees, both exotic and, nat and native. Uh, boom, boom, boom. He was involved in the design? Very much so, as were most of these properties. Uh, they, it, was, it was a hobby. They all uh, read the same books about landscape. Uh, many of the classical allegories were things that they shared. Uh, they communicated back and forth with one another. For example, within uh, a bird's eye view, you have Locust Grove, Springside, and the Poughkeepsie Rural Cemetery, which all uh, began about the same time. Hmm. I can tell you a little bit about how we operate in our horticulture department. We're a very small department. Tim is uh, full-time here and I'm half-time and that's pretty much it. We have two guys who do grounds where they mow the lawns and take care of the grounds, but we rely very heavily on our volunteers for gardening at Locust Grove. Do you know how much uh, much the gardens cover? 19 acres. Really? Okay, right. so it's the two of you, or yep. one and a half of you. One right? and a half of us, <laughs> and this tremendous core of, of volunteers who are just the greatest people in the world. And they come in on um, Tuesdays to work in the flowers and ornamentals, and then on Thursdays to work in our heritage vegetable garden. This is a shot early in the year where we're working in the greenhouse, um, starting some of our of our crops from seed in the greenhouse that then will be moved out to harden off in cold frames and then be planted out into the garden. But the volunteers are involved right from the start, so from planting process aspects. to uh, the actual planting and, and um, harvesting in the vegetable garden, all the maintenance, and you'll see shots of them working hard in the garden throughout the year. For example, this past weekend, we were potting, past Thursday, we were potting uh, uh, plugs and we, accomplished the planting of 350 plugs in two hours. Wow. Wow. I want them to come to my house. <laughs> Oops, I skipped someone, didn't I? No, I think no? that's okay. Okay, because I did want to ask you, you're still accepting volunteers? If people want to come, it's they a, just show up or it's a, call? We have, a, we have an application form, but we're glad for them to come just any time to see if it's something that interests them. Um, it's a very welcoming group. Uh, Many of them uh, found out the, about our program um, through other programs and from one another. That's right. Word of mouth is always mm -hmm. our, our greatest um, recruiter, and uh, we, but we are always happy to have people come. And they, they learn a lot from us and really enjoy the social aspect as well as the, um, the hands-on gardening that we do. I could verify that because I was a volunteer for many years, and you, you let people do the actual, you know, you get to touch everything. There's nothing that's, uh, you know, you're not just sat in a corner to weed or something. No. You let people actually it's get very, involved. It's very focused, uh, very focused, and and the uh, the volunteers are set up with a with a, a program from week to week, so it's it's comfortable for us and for the volunteers. Um, all the uh, things that they need, like shovels, um, all the tools, including gloves, are available. So it's a real nice trade-off. 
Good. Sounds good. Let's talk a little bit about what you actually grow here. Okay. Um, this is to start out our, our talk about some of the collections that we have here at Locust Grove. Um, one of the things we wanted to talk about today is that even though we are a historic site primarily, we're also a public garden that's experienced at many levels and visitors find practical information that they can bring to their home garden. So we wanted to talk a little bit about what we're growing here and how people can relate that to their own garden. So in addition to the historic trees that Tim had mentioned earlier, those are our first collection. Um, our best known collection here at Locust Grove are the historic peonies that we have here. And these date back to the young family who lived here uh, starting in 1898. They at Locust Grove and they started planting gardens almost immediately and one of the first things they planted was this very large collection of peonies that they continued to add to each year and we have records that show um, hundreds, hundreds of peonies hundreds that of they they purchased and planted here at Locust extensive Grove. Extensive correspondence with nurserymen. Uh, it always remained Mrs. Young's favorite flower. Uh, she she had lists and lists in, in her hand of the different varieties that were used. Uh, we have a bulletin from the local Millbrook Garden Club that says, any day but Sunday, come at twilight to get the best view. And it was May, and the classification was peonies. Wow. So is that bed that's out there now, that, is that, was that started by her? Correct, yeah, and that's the original location is the, the really? what we refer to as the main garden. And we have a theory, it will show up in a slide later on in the, the program, um, that she ran out of space in that bed, and that's when <laughs> she started planting in the vegetable garden, which was beyond the tool shed. So that's wow. where we have a second collection of peonies, in, or a second planting of peonies in uh, just south of our tool we shed as well. never have too many peonies. <laughs> and there are probably 20 varieties mm -hmm. that survive today. We don't have them identified by name, but we categorize yeah. them. And we have uh, close to 20 varieties yeah. that are survived. It's a remnant of the, of the original collection because we do not add varieties. We work within the within what we we have. So the 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 uh, number of varieties that were used in the bloom periods that they covered, we don't necessarily cover all of them uh, now. Let's talk about how you ooh, I'm finger happy here. How you care for them and what you. Okay, well, peonies um, can last for, as we've talked about, over 100 years, <laughs> so they're, they're tremendous survivors, but over time, it's a good idea to dig and divide them, and that's also how we filled in with the surviving varieties, and we filled in the beds with, with the peonies that we have, and in addition, for the past probably 10 years, we've been running a peony sale in the fall in September, so that our visitors can add a little piece of history to their own gardens at home by having a young family uh, peony to, to purchase and take home and that helps to benefit our, our gardens as well. It's a fundraiser for us. So this shows a very old peony that probably hadn't been divided for maybe 15 to 20 years and it's dead in the center but lots of live little plants around the perimeter of this, this peony. So they're quite monstrous and large when they go for a long period of time but they still survive. So this is a, a large plant that's been dug and if you go to the next slide we can show you um, this is a finished division so we ha always make sure that we have at least three eyes left on the crown of the plant and that's a good um, purchase for people because that will ensure that they get blooms the next year although we do as much as I oftentimes will leave a flower so I can see what it actually is um, it's a good idea to remove the flowers the first year so oh, really? the plant can get a little bit better established and the eyes are the little white um Correct, uh, almost like on a potato yeah. where you can see okay. the little buds that are starting. And this is in the fall, so we've already cut down the top of the plant, but this eye is already present there and, and active on the plant at that time. And we never uh, offer all the varieties at once. Different, different varieties have different rates of vigor um, so that we select each year which ones, as we dig them, which ones will be for sale. So if people are interested in a more or less a complete collection of what we have, they'll do it over, over several years. several years. Right, yes. right. Yeah, we're in the process of restoring the, the 
or replanting those that are in the main garden that need the division anyway. So we, we look at a section of the garden that we're going to be digging for that year and those are the varieties that we will sell for that year. And again, only those that we know we have enough of. If we're very limited on a single dark pink, we won't sell that that year. We'll make sure that we hold that back and plant more of them in the garden. Is there a specific weekend when you have the sale? Or it just it's usually the second weekend in September that they're available, but check our website and okay. it will definitely be posted there. All right, let's see. And then the second collection that we have here in the main garden is our dahlia collection. And uh, Martha Young did grow dahlias in this location, but we are fortunate today, while we don't know exactly which varieties, because most of her plant orders would say just cactus flower or pom-pom, um, they didn't actually list varieties. But there are many varieties available today from old house gardens and mm. a few other sources, Swan Island dahlias, Fry's dahlias, I believe, are a couple that we've purchased from recently. And all of these varieties, um, some of them are species that date back to the 1700s. Oh, directly from that. Mexico. directly from Mexico and others are just beautiful varieties that were developed over the years and probably our most recent one is from about 1948 so we reflect kind of a long period of history in the variety in the varieties that we've selected but these have here. to be dug every year yes. they do and, and, store them. and that's where the volunteers are just so wonderful <laughs> it makes a job that might be somewhat overwhelming if it were just the two of us uh, makes it a really pleasant and, and enjoyable experience but they're they're well worth the effort obviously because they put on such a show. It's almost 40 varieties. Yeah, almost they, 40 varieties. And 100 and 140 feet. feet. There's about 70 plants yeah. in the uh -huh. row, just short of yeah. 70 plants. The, in the, row. the thing with dahlias is that over the past 100 years, most of the farms have repeated themselves. So even though we don't have a variety that was available in 1910, there are modern varieties that look the same as they did in that period. Uh, dahlias are subject to virus, so uh, there are only so many that that do survive over time. Where do you store them? <laughs> well, that's that's our insurance policy question. We actually store them in three locations, ah. just to just in case, so we don't or so we lose fewer. Um, we do lose a few varieties from year to year, but that's a good excuse to go out and buy more and maybe find something that's available <laughs> this year that maybe wasn't available last year and still a historic variety. So some of them are stored. Um, above our office, which is the head house of the greenhouse. There's a second floor and we store some of them there. Our best success in recent years has actually been the mansion basement where it stays cool and it's somewhat moist down there. It's not way dry, but it's not so, it's not soggy either. So um, that's actually been our best storage location. And then whatever we have multiples of that there are extras I bring home and put in my basement at home just as the, the insurance policy. So if one variety didn't make it in either of those other locations, I have the third set there to pull go. from. That's smart. <laughs> and we divide in the fall. In the fall, okay. Yes. Okay, and you also have more borders. Oh, here's, oh, the, here's more of the, the dahlias. Here is just showing our volunteers hard at work, and here they're just grooming dahlias, so taking all the dead flowers off so that we have our best display possible. Not yeah. bad work if you can get it, yeah. <laughs> Crowds of people <clears throat> wear off the path. Oh. <laughs> so the, so the, the first thing every week when the dahlias are in bloom is for two people to go through and groom mm -hmm. so that it's at its best whenever the visitors come. Yes, we're good. much more successful at growing dahlias than we are at growing grass in that path. That's been a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. The borders are the area where we're, we, the design is much more informal in nature. Uh, the groups of plants are mostly in single colors. Uh, they interlock like pieces of a puzzle. The garden is in full bloom more or less from uh, the end of May until October, and that is only made possible by the fact that we use probably 20, two dozen different annuals every year, coupled with perennials and some sub shrubs and a few shrubs. Um, it's in it's in very very uh, very colorful during that whole period. Um, this year we're shifting the 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 flower color uh, range to a much warmer palette, oranges and reds and yellows. It's been in much softer colors before. Of course, the the true blues will always stay. There aren't that many. Uh, and it's also over 100 feet long and 10 feet wide um, and very much follows the, 
the tradition of the turn of the century um, jiggle style border. And do you have records from Mrs. Young on what she would have grown? Oh, on? yes. Oh, yes. Try there are many orders and lots of seed catalogs. And, and she will check things. Um, she sometimes, when they were abroad, would would buy seed packets and her diaries at various points are annotated. Um, she was a very enthusiastic consumer. <laughs> so the, the question is not so much what she what she what she grow grew at certain points it's what she didn't grow okay so nice of her to keep such records though then there are things that varieties of plants that that the public knows like morning glories uh that we most of us know uh the uh heavenly blue but at the turn of the century the japanese imperial morning glories were the popular ones and not only did they have flowers of other <clears throat> shades, uh, many of them pinwheels. Uh, the one that we have the picture of is a is a deep blue with a ripped corner folded over. There are doubles. Uh, their foliage is often marbleized. So here's an example of how a plant will change over time, and the they are becoming they are coming back in in popularity. Uh, I ordered the, uh, we use five different types on our rose, or, rose arbors and I was, they were sold out in catalogs so I bought them from eBay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but the varieties are still available? Very much so. They're all, they're all, there's a culture in Japan uh, very much like chrysanthemums. They grow them in small pots and they, they are all named. Wow. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Give it that. And summer bulbs, uh, again, to get that that range of flowering, um, we use a good amount of summer bulbs. And the picture here is of Galtonia candy cans, uh, which is a South African bulb and is hardy for us. Uh, wow. We off, it often is said to be hardy only to New York. It often will send up two spikes of bloom. It blooms in midsummer, and it, the stature of it is about 36 inches tall. Nice. So it's very, very nice. Uh, it, one of the bulbs that we cheat a little bit on are gladiolas. Um, every time, every every period of time period has popular plants, and gladiolas are one. Um, we don't grow uh, the big showy ones that all need to be staked. We grow um, the the uh, African species Murali, um, which is is very elegant. We have a picture of that. No. Yeah. Okay. And then the annuals, uh, the nasturtiums, for example, this year we're using three different ones. Uh, the thing that we want that is a cardinal uh, yeah, uh, requirement is that the flowers sit on top of the plant. I was just noticing that. Yeah. And, and so that that's, that's very, very central so that they, they, you have to do as little grooming as possible to get those flowers to show. This year we're growing three different varieties. So you guys have learned a lot about lowering maintenance. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And uh -huh. delphiniums, which it's one of the photographs that we have of, in a border is of tall delphiniums at the at the turn of the century. Uh, our secret with growing them is is that they're weed free, that they are uh, lots of organic matter and and organic fertilizer. Uh, and one of the tricks that we learned this last fall, this last summer, has nothing to do with 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 coming up with it. It's it's only finding it by happenstance. We didn't have enough time to maintain them, to stake them individually. The classic thing is to pinch out and keep the largest, to exaggerate the, the height and the, the, the uh, girth of the flowers. By leaving all the flowers come up, we didn't have to stake them. Oh, great. That's a wonderful tip. And, yeah, they can be very temperamental here, so I'm quite jealous. 
I'll have to try more. We more also use there. a little one at as border edge called Blue Mirror, which is is sure for people to be successful with. Blue Mirror. Blue Mirror. Well, it only grows a one. foot tall. <laughs> it only grows a foot tall, but it's that same cobalt blue. Yeah, that's worth it. And here's an example of where many hands come in very handy. <laughs> um, we have a series of formal uh, beds that would have been popular in the era before the First World War where plants were used almost like crayons. Uh, we do two plantings a year, one of which is in the fall. We put out about nearly 500 pansies also in a single variety and the Delta series has proven fully hardy for us. We also use a, a, a an agricultural fabric that's that's often used with overwintering uh, strawberries and it does a superb job. The first week in June that planting is taken up and we replace it. Uh, it changes from year to year but one of our favorites is is coleus. Do you keep the um Pansies, or do you just compost them at that point? People can take them home, but the... One the, of the perks of volunteering uh, is taking home discards and freebies. Good perk. <laughs> but again, the thing with them is that their flowers in early April, where they flower so much earlier since they were planted in the fall, we get very large flowers. By the time we get toward the end of May, we haven't had time to deadhead them. So uh, the plants by that point are, are close to being exhausted. Right. This is the coleus? Yes. Ah, that is gorgeous. Look for ideas. This is here. rustic orange. This has been one of our standards. It's a great uh, branching one that doesn't get to be too tall, so it doesn't require a lot of pinching. Occasionally, we'll get a few flower heads on it, and then mm -hmm. we'll pinch, but um, one or two pinches a year is sufficient. And uh, great color. Again, the bright colors carry very well through the landscape, so this is one that you can see from all the way across the lawn. You can, you can yeah. really see these beds. Any idea how many plants are in these It's beds. a little less than the, the pansies, but it's still close to four hundred. It's, it's just shy of a hundred in each of the four triangles that yeah. are there. So, That's so thick. Um, yeah. We, we grow them from, we grow many things from seed, but we grow our, our large bedding plant where we plants, which we need in, in large numbers. We use plugs and they just went in the coleus this past weekend. In the greenhouse? Yes, mm -hmm. in the greenhouse, yes. Hopefully. Hopefully we'll be planting soon. Yeah. <laughs> More gorgeous orange. And the the beds are uh, each or two of the large beds are well. These four beds are centered on a on a 19th century urn, which we plant usually uh, with color coordinated annuals. Um, sometimes modern, sometimes not. Here the angelonia, which I'm sure Mrs. Young wished she had. Uh, <laughs> Gives this constant color with very little, uh, very little uh, deadheading. Uh, we've also had tremendous luck using the profusion series of zinnias. Mm. Yeah, they're nice. They don't get the mill, do they? Keep they don't blooming. need to be deadheaded. Yes, <laughs> very nice. Ah, now we're going to move over to the Heritage Vegetable Garden. Okay, the Vegetable Garden is another place where our visitors can come and, and learn some things about what we're doing that are historic, but perhaps they can still use in their gardens at home. So in addition to get their lesson in history, they also pick up tips for, for their own home gardens. I see a John Deere in there, don't I? Oh, absolutely. That's not <laughs> historic, but it comes in very handy. That's our, our gator, and that's uh, key for helping us to move things in and out of the garden here. So um, if we advance the slide we can take a look this is more of an overall shot um, one of the things that our visitors gain from visiting the garden is being able to see some things that either they don't know that you can grow in this part of the country or perhaps they've never seen growing before and here we have um, imperial star artichoke um, almost all of our vegetables that we grow in the heritage vegetable garden are heirloom varieties this is the one of maybe two exceptions. Um, this is a artichoke which is suited for growing in the Northeast. So we start it very early in the greenhouse and as soon as we get true leaves on it, it goes out into the cold frame so that it experiences a little bit of cold temperature. We trick because it. artichokes are, are normally a perennial and mild, milder 
climates and wouldn't uh, produce their buds that we eat until the second year. So this particular variety does produce the first year, but it still benefits from going through that cold period early on in its growth. So um, You grow it as an annual, though. We, yeah, we grow, grow it as, as an, an annual, annual. Well, yes. We thought we had them coming back one year, but they, they didn't. Oh. So <laughs> um, we, we did experiment one year also with keeping some down in a root cellar and replanting, but that wasn't so successful either. But this particular variety does um, produce for us quite well. It'll vary from year to year, mm -hmm. but this is one where people will certainly ask us about it and then um, try it themselves at home and report back to us that they also had success and would like nice. to hear that. And as Sue said, the, the garden is enti almost entirely selections, mm -hmm. um, as is the, the flower garden is largely selections as well. Um, so people get a an idea where we often grow more varieties than a single one of a type of plant, um, they really get to, to see um, how vegetables, their appearance in the past, and also the productivity of these heirloom mm. varieties. Is it good usually? Or you know, not as good as a... Oh, um, you know, I think it's a, one of those... Uh, the quality certainly is better, um, and as far as productivity, it just depends on the type of vegetable that it is. Um, and certainly, the year. we have yeah. right. <laughs> we have some really dependable things that produce very well, and then some things will really vary from year to year. Beans and beets. Oh, and sure. lettuce. Yeah, we have, we have, have lots them. of things that just are, are yeah. fantastic, yeah. and the heirlooms are certainly perform equally. So um, it's that old horticultural saying, it all depends. That's it right. All depends. Absolutely. It all depends. Absolutely. And, and also disease resistance. That's right. Um, for the last several years, we've had wonderful cantaloupes and mm -hmm. watermelons. Right. Uh, but we can, of course, have years where we don't have anything. Exactly. Yeah, that's one of the more highly variable. <laughs> and then the tomatoes, obviously, are, are all susceptible to late blight, the heirloom varieties we have. So we, we ward it off for as long as we can. But mm -hmm. the last several, last year was okay, but the two years prior to that, we, we did lose crops of tomatoes to late blight. You lose them with hybrids too. Oh, no, sure. You do. This and is interesting. <laughs> yeah, this is a fun one. Um, a vegetable that lots of folks haven't seen before, and if they have, they don't know what it is with sitting on the, the shelf at Adams. But um, this is celeriac, and this is um, something that we do grow very well here at Locust Grove. Uh, this variety is called Large Smooth Prog, um, but it's really not all that smooth. It's this very <laughs> knobby vegetable that it's the, the root that you're eating. The top looks a lot like celery, and you can use that in stock, but it's really much too tough and fine to eat like a stalk of cel celery, but um, the part that is most choice is that bulbous uh, base that's um, part of the root system growing just at the surface of the soil and below the surface of the soil. And as that is peeled away, it reveals this very white flesh that um, is has a mild celery flavor, but it's very delicious. Both it's raw so is a, a salad, and then uh, roasted in vegetables mm. and or roasted mixed vegetables with potatoes, mixed with potatoes, potatoes mashed, mashed yeah. potatoes. Uh, it holds its shape mm -hmm. in a stew or soup very well, um, and it also will store in a cold in a in a root cellar or in your refrigerator for mm -hmm. two or three months. Oh wow! So you can have yeah. celery in the into the winter. That's right. And one of our volunteers stores it in a garage and foam containers where it doesn't freeze up and, and it works very well for her to store in that manner as well. That's industrious. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you start this from seed? We do. We start this from seed in the greenhouse. It's one of the more slow to germinate, so this one can be a little bit fussy getting started, but once we get out in the garden, it's usually quite successful. Hmm. To try. And here we have a sweet potato. One of our volunteers is harvesting sweet potatoes here. And um, this is another plant that we've we've tried. We started out with Georgia Jet, which is the variety that Mary's holding up in this picture. And again, this is a hybrid variety that's suited for the Northeast. But over recent years, we've been experimenting with some of the heirloom varieties that are available. And we found some that perform almost or, or equally as well as the Georgia Jet. So we're also growing uh, purple and a white variety now. Yeah. Uh, the lace leaf is a little less productive, so we are, we're actually trying some new varieties this year that we haven't tried in the past and expanding on the four that we've, we've been growing over the past several and, years. And it's very interesting as well that they have um, different flavors and textures. Absolutely. Uh, which is something that 
none of us would have been aware of no. unless we grew the, all of these varieties. That's a beautiful one there. I grew them and they came in interesting shapes. Uh -huh. Not as gorgeous as that one there. <laughs> well, the white ones look kind of like intestines. They get all knotted up on themselves, but wow. they're, they're a lot of fun. That's appetizing. <laughs> <Okay>. Wow. <laughs> And this is fennel, um, Florence fennel that we've uh, grown in our, our garden. We've started seeds in the greenhouse, but we also do some direct sowing as well on this. Um, it likes it, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit on the cool side. And we do harvest for the bulbous base on the, the plant here. Um, but then we let a few of them uh, go to flower, which we found that the flowers is an edible flower are absolutely mm. spectacular. And then wow. also um, the seeds can be collected and fennel seed is very commonly used in Italian and other Mediterranean cooking. Um, but uh, we, we have been harvesting both flowers and seed from the plants as well in the past few and years. And this is one of the places where if we were growing for production, mm -hmm. we'd often pick it earlier. Uh, the thing is that some vegetables like fennel, which are uh, very ornamental and also something that, that fit into the classification of unusual vegetables, will leave at least half the crop beyond its optimum time to be picked. Yeah, we want people to be able to see things as a demonstration garden first, and then um, harvesting and taking them home is wonderful, but that's secondary to our demonstration. Process. Can you succession plant it or not? We've not tried, yes. and we've gotten some babies in the fall. We haven't gotten a full-size fennel like this, but the young ones are, are as Tim was saying, much more tender, so mm -hmm. those sliced up into salads are absolutely fantastic. Good to try. Mm -hmm. That's what we got here. And now we're moving on to some of what are just our favorites that uh, maybe people haven't seen before. So the tiny thing that looks almost like a pumpkin in the center is a um, Doe Hill Golden Bell Pepper. So mm -hmm. this is a small uh, yellow to orange pepper, very sweet and um, wonderful for eating fresh or stuffing. It's a beautiful And it reliably pepper. colors up for it us. It does. Um, some of the yellow peppers are a little bit harder to grow. We've done some other larger varieties in the past, but this one has been much more productive and, and colors very well. About how large are they? About a fist? Um, not even. No, maybe um, maybe three inches, two to three, between two and three inches okay. in diameter, so small. And then some of the other uh, others in the basket here, we have the early white bush scallop squash, also called a patty pan, and there's a double of that up on the top here. But that's another one that's really been a, a favorite of ours in the garden for many years and historically grown by Martha Young um, every year. So that's one a summer of her favorites squash, right? as well. Yes. That is a summer squash, that's right. So harvest harvest time, harvest day on, on Thursdays is like this picture, it's a cornucopia of things. Mm -hmm. It's it's really beautiful to see um, all those things in flats together. And it's mm. it's another thing where the garden being a, a largely a volunteer activity, oddly, one of the more difficult things to get volunteers to do is the harvesting. <laughs> really? And, and it takes, as we get into August, it takes two people, lar the large part of the morning to to do the harvest? Wow. Well, part of that is because um, things like beans, <laughs> yes. that's not necessarily, there are a few volunteers who really enjoy the bean picking, but some of that can be kind of tedious. Yeah. And you do three people, a lot. That's three right. people can go through the same row That's of right. Beans. You always find the ones you left behind. That's <laughs> they right. They really need to be a different color, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so as we continue here, um, then some of our most dependable crops, and lettuce certainly is one of the oldest um, varieties. We have some of the oldest varieties in the garden are in our lettuce crop, and it's also our one of our most productive patches. We grow um, five varieties in one garden and between three and five in another bed, so representing the different families that lived at Locust Grove. The Livingstons were the earliest um, residents here, so in our colonial period garden, we have five varieties that date back from um, anywhere from the 1600s to the 1700s, these varieties represent those. Um, in the foreground here, you see oak leaf, and then we also have cimarron, uh, red deer tongue in that garden. Um, for well, <laughs> we'll write those My down opportunity for you. Put those in the notes. <laughs> well done. I'm surprised because a lot of people, you know, 
what was it about eight, 10 years ago when they first started coming out with colorful lettuces, mm -hmm. uh, mainstream thought that they were a new introduction and they certainly are not. Right, right. Oh, I remember no. bringing a bag of lettuce to my mom when um, I went to visit that we had harvested it at Locust Grove and she asked me what was wrong with the spotted <laughs> lettuce and I was like, I was shocked and horrified. That what is thought the beautiful there was wrong. marbleized one? That that is yeah. the, that's the Ferelenschluss, which is, is the uh, is, uh, trout back yeah, is its it, other name. It is lovely it is, speckled. It is equal or more beautiful than anything that, mm -hmm. that's come out in the last few years. Definitely. That's right. Oh, we're back to Back okay. to the flower garden here. Right. Here we were we wanted to talk a little bit, in addition to the different types of, of plants that we grow here at Locust Grove that people can learn about um, some of the planting practices that we follow. And one of the most important is how to support a plant. And are peonies, these as you know, also? this is the, the practices. The practices um, are based on what we've seen historically, but are adapted to more modern um, conditions. Yeah. Okay. So large collections some, of peonies have it pretty much been done this way in any photograph. Right, we've seen. right. We've seen that we do have some historic photos where you can see a wooden brace around the end of the peony rows, and then those are connected as well. So, um, in some cases, there were actual uh, structures that were put into place that were more, um, perhaps a little more refined than this. Um, here, we are using bamboo stakes, so they're four foot bamboo stakes that are pounded into the ground, and then string, just a uh, jute twine that's connected um, at two levels. So we have running up and down the rows, we have um, the twine that's maybe a f between eight inches and a foot off the ground for the lower level, and then about two to two and a half feet for the upper level of the of the string. And these help to support the long rows of peonies from falling over as the flower heads form and they get very heavy. Mm -hmm. And after rain, they can splay wide open. So this, this particular practice uh, helps us to keep them upright and standing where we can enjoy them. Do you put the stakes in before they get large? Or? Yes. Yes. Next week. That's actually going to be yeah. happening tomorrow. So <laughs> that's on the docket okay. for tomorrow yeah. to uh, get those stakes in there. And it can vary from year to year. The mm -hmm. peonies were a little slow starting this year. So some years we've actually have already done this by now. Um, but they're moving very quickly. And today they'll be Moving even more quickly. <laughs> and again, this is this is a, a system that's very practical, uh, but at the same time, it's something that can be done rather efficiently mm -hmm. uh, by a group of people. And our volunteers usually do it in either one work session or two. Right. Well, they probably have experience at this point. Oh, yes. Have some very that's a drill. That's <laughs> pretty well. Very in-depth tires there. That's right. And then we use a very similar technique for, for uh, staking our dahlias. And here you can see the plants are quite small here, but our strings are, are going up a slightly different pattern. It's almost more like a triangle around each plant here. So it's continuous in the, the front, but then coming to a point but in the, um, the back of the plant. Um, and here are our volunteers. Um, and after you fumble around on the first few ties, and then you get really good at it as you go. So um, by the time you get to the end of that 140 foot mm -hmm. row, you're moving along pretty quickly. So you have to tuck the plants in, I assume, as they start to grow. Yes, yes. Correct. Them in yeah. line. Just yes. Get tucked in. And we also place. know through experience that some of them that are that tend to be top heavy that that they're going to need more support. <laughs> right. Right. Hmm. You've got a head start at least. Mm-hmm. And this is in the vegetable garden, again, in the, um, the Livingston garden, which is, again, our colonial period garden. Uh, these are pole beans being grown on a rustic tripod that's built from saplings that we've collected from the property. So during colonial times, um, you would not have gone to the lumber yard or to Home Depot to get your material, so you had to find things on site to use. And this is a beautiful practice that many people uh, can use in their own homes, uh, particularly if they have a larger property where they can go and collect um, collect uh, their own wood for making trellises. And the, the rustic nature of this is very attractive, very pretty. It is, and it's a nice, strong, sturdy support. It, it is. It's going to fall over is. when they get And easy things. to pick. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for some of us, we like pole beans better than any other. <laughs> Yeah, and moving on to other types of structures, this is probably our most asked about uh, plant support on the property. Um, this is a tomato trellis that um, the original design was published in uh, mid 1800s. Um, period periodical called the horticulturist that was um, 
produced by Andrew Jackson Downing. And um, local was, boy, right? <laughs> that's right, from Newburgh, New York. And um, it was interesting because it was kind of like the way um, horticulture magazine or fine gardening is today in that people will write in questions and then put in their own um, recommendations for how they approach a particular mm -hmm. problem. And tomatoes were still fairly new to uh, gardening at that time prior to 1830 that many people thought that they were poisonous. So they were still kind of a new crop and people were trying to figure out how to, how to manage this kind of unwieldy thing. So there were lots and lots of recommendations of how different people handled their tomato trellising. And this particular design was a design from a gentleman in Milton, so again just across the river from us, another local person, uh, had come up with this sort of ladder-like structure um, on almost an A-frame. It's straight in the back and then angled in the front. And the tomatoes are attached to that front trellis and it really maximizes sun exposure in that way. And so they're in this sort of almost flat surface there for maximum sun exposure, excellent air circulation yeah. that can move through there. And they can be harvested from both sides of the trellis, which is That's also nice. really nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, and our and, and our trellises here in the in the Morris Garden, how many tomato varieties do we usually grow? There are grow? six varieties of heirloom tomatoes, and that's something that we can kind of switch up from year to year as yeah. we come across more heirlooms that are available that perhaps we haven't tried before, or go back to some of our old favorites again, um, where we do have some some favorite ones that we like to grow, like Aunt Ruby's German Green is one that uh, we don't grow it every year, but it always comes back after a few years because it's fantastic. Um, but these trellises, again, are kind of interesting and in that one one thing we discovered after they were built was that they actually um, fold up like an accordion. So while they look kind of large in the landscape here, they they uh, become very compact when they fold up and are stored away for the winter. You so should the, sell the plans for these. I'm sure <laughs> they We get a lot of requests for the plans, actually. And we don't sell them, but we do give them away. Uh -huh. So anyone who, who's interested, we do have um, we do have some drawings uh, that are Terrific. available that we can share. That's great. And then this is, uh, to contrast with that, this is in the young period garden where we're just growing uh, tomatoes on a, a single stake here. And these are just one by ones from uh, the lumber yard that we're using to stake our tomatoes there. And again, good air circulation, good sun exposure, a little different kind of a sun exposure than the others, but um, they produce very well in this kind of a system as well. Okay. And then another practice um, that you can see here, well, a couple of practices actually. This is the, the Livingston, so again, our colonial period garden in um, early fall. So we have probably our third planting of lettuce. We get at least two plantings of lettuce in that garden in the spring. And then in late summer, we begin seeding again. And in this case, we directly seed in the garden itself. And here we're also planting in raised beds. So that's another practice that dates back to colonial times, which is becoming very popular again today and certainly works very well for us here, where uh, the soil is just mounded up. It's really not edged in any way in this particular garden. And then we've added any kind of manure and compost can be added just to the areas where you're going to be planting, not to the pathway. So it's much more efficient in that way. Um, makes it a little bit easier to, to work around in the raised bed areas and also allows for excellent air drainage. Those beds heat up a little faster than any of the other beds in the spring, so we're able to work them earlier. Um, so it's, it's really a very nice system and, and works just as well for us today as it did a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. And in that garden, we, we, the number of things that we grow in it is, is oh, staggering. It's very densely planted, and this raised bed system works very well for that. I see you use straw for mulching. Uh, we sometimes use straw. We've moved actually much more to um, the leaves from our, our um, the trees in our landscape that uh, fall. As our grounds guys yeah. suck them up with a big vacuum, they bring them over to us to use as mulch. And some of the ones that are more um, composted over the course of a year, those are mostly what goes to the vegetable garden is our mulch nice. there as well. They prove to be much more weed impervious than straw. Than the straw. Do you, well, are they shredded through the vacuum? They're slightly shredded. Yeah. So they're not um, they're not whole, but they're not like a fine shred either. So they you still can tell it you can still tell that they're leaves, but they are broken up somewhat. Oh, that's nice. Everybody's got leaves. That's right. And uh, again, from our colonial period garden, we're showing here uh, er an Iroquois practice that was used um, by the colonists in our area that they adopted from the Iroquois Indians who lived in the area at the time. 
And um, this is a three sisters planting. So the three sisters are corn, beans, and squash that are planted together and probably the earliest known companion planting in this, this country anyway. Um, the corn acts as a support for the pole beans and the pole beans uh, fix nitrogen for the atmosphere. So they uh, fertilize not only themselves, but also the corn and the squash in the planting. And then the squash that's planted on the understory acts as a living mulch. So it also helps to conserve moisture and keep weeds out of the planting. Oh, so yeah, never weed in this planting. It's pretty amazing. So um, this is a really neat practice where it's very, again, you can get some um, production out of a small space of, of three different kinds of plants growing together and they're all helping each other out. Just have to be careful where you step, I guess. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Tiptoeing through the leaves is nice a little tricky. Leaves, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Oh, and here you can um, see another practice that we use, which is not historic, but works very well and has been a real um, maintenance saver for us in the vegetable garden and in other gardens and the yes. ornamental gardens as well. We've been using it too. So here you can see our volunteers laying newspaper around the plants. Um, is then going to be covered up with the leaves that we just spoke about, um, a leaf mulch over the top of the newspapers. So the newspapers are at least six layers thick, and we're using both collected newspapers here, so old uh, Poughkeepsie journals here, as well as um, the long sheets that you see are actually from end rolls that we've purchased from Southern Duchess News. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll go um, six layers deep around the plants and then cover that with the leaves, and that really works tremendously well, well to keep well. the weeds down and conserve moisture around the plants. And Do they it's, dissolve, disintegrate? Yeah, and they break down over time yeah, so that there's no right removal that we have to do the following year when it's time to roto-till the garden. That's We're just good. able to chop them right up and they go right back to the soil. I'd like to hear that, yes. Yeah. So. Oh. What happened here? Yeah, we had those other... They so gone. We had it. Oh, I'm sorry. Well. We've lost a few photos here. Um, we can talk about them. Yeah, sure. The, uh, 2014 is the 100th anniversary of the beginning of the First World War. Uh, of course, the United States did not enter the war until 1917, but we're starting this year since the uh, Youngs were very involved in supporting the, especially the French war effort. Uh, the, for this year and next year, the house and the landscape are being interpreted in uh, how the First World War affected uh, people on a property like Locust Grove. Hmm. Uh, so that with the, with the garden, we are growing uh, more of a couple of crops like peas, uh, things that are in gardens that aren't necessarily of that period. Um, the large number of potatoes that were grown, uh, the necessity that we don't really remember from history that there were over a million uh, war gardens, home gardens during the First World War. Uh, we avoided uh, rationing, but it allowed for uh, millions of pounds of food to be delivered to Britain and France that were suffering from the submarine embargo. Uh, as we've done it, we found all sorts of, of visuals, posters of that go from uh, showing the Kaiser in a ball jar um, that, that encouraged people to can not only vegetables, but the Kaiser um, to, to um, evocations of, of uh, uh, patriotism, uh, also the whole idea that there were demonstration gardens in many large cities and places like Bryant Park in the center of New York. Uh, so it's a very interesting project for us because we're not only bringing this information in a living way to our public, but we're, we're learning as we go along. And I guess the 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 uh, whole idea of how the garden the vegetable garden is 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 really enjoyed the the single largest uh visitorship that we have for it is a series called Sets, sunset sensations which is a food and wine pairing the food is based on the varieties of vegetables that are in season at the time of the 
uh, the, uh, the event and uh, we send a list to the chef and he tries as much as possible to use the varieties that were that are listed in the at the time uh, it, it's about 150 people every month from May until November uh, we have a, a garden tour every every time um, and of that 150 we clearly get between half and two-thirds every time and many of them are return visitors um, it's also been an excellent source of, of uh, recruitment for oh, yeah. volunteers mm, really. Absolutely. Yeah. so they get to come the, the chefs cook right there a demonstration and they get to taste it yes they do and then and the wine is the wine is matched usually it moves from different places outside the the primary uh, place for the actual uh, event is over on the west lawn of the house yeah, so the that universe. it truly is for the sunsets um, but they always then trek to the garden, um, usually in the middle of the program. And that's once a month? Once a month. Yeah, second Thursday of every month. Terrific. So, uh, yeah, we're always uh, looking for more people to come to that. It's a lot of fun, but you do have to buy your tickets early because it's almost always a sellout. So that's one that makes sense to plan ahead for if you can. Okay. And if we can't um, visit the garden in any particular second yes. Thursday, um, we had, I think it was two years ago, where it rained and thunderstormed <laughs> on the second Thursday of every month. <laughs> uh -huh. But then we bring the garden indoors. So we harvest and set up a display a table, table and then that's a nice way for people to be able to get up close and, and really see some of the different varieties that we're growing and learn something about. And the weather is variable. We sometimes do both. That's right. <laughs> and and <laughs> the thing is that then your, your questions are much more extensive. Um, we have people who will come with six or seven gardening questions. Oh, absolutely. And you'll yeah. be there for 20 minutes after the program has <laughs> ended. That's right. Sounds like fun. It is. Okay, um, I think we've reached the end here, unless there's anything else you want to add. No, thank you oh. so much for, for thank having us. You too. This was um, just an awesome amount of knowledge you passed along here. Um, I would like to thank everyone who's been watching. If you'd like more information about visiting Locust Grove, you can find them on the web at, as you see, www.lgny.org. Uh, remember, if you missed any episodes, be sure to check them on the website at www.gardeningthehudsonvalley.com. And I hope you're excited about starting to visit gardens as well as picking up some great ideas from your, for your own gardens from these webinars. And we'll see you next time. Thank you all.